So good morning, uh, ladies and gents. Um, very pleased and, in fact, privileged to be here this morning. Um, and I blame that on Sean. Um, just over 12 months ago, around April last year, uh, Sean came to me and said, hey, you've set up this force design division within the Australian uh, Department of Defence. We've got this systems engineering symposium we're conducting. Uh, we'd like you to come and talk to us about it. And uh, I said, well, Sean, we're just starting, mate. We're, it's, uh, we're not quite sure how we're going to do this yet. There's a fair bit of detail, and I'd hate to sort of stand up and not really have much to talk about. He said, OK, well, how about, um, how about you come back next year and do it? And I said, yep, that'll be fine. And of course, be careful what you wish for, uh, because he then explained that this was the, the time that we host uh, in Adelaide, the international part of the Systems Engineering Conference. So, Sean, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. I hope that I can be of use to you uh, in terms of what I'm, I'm here to explain. Uh, and I'm certainly very pleased to be uh, in, in my backyard uh, back in Adelaide. Uh, I, I uh, finished my high school years here in Adelaide before I joined the Air Force in 1980. So uh, it's been quite a few years since I formally left. Uh, my parents still live here. They're on Kangaroo Island. Um, and uh, I have family in the Adelaide area, so we, we visit here quite regularly, so it's great, great to be home. Um, if I could certainly start by acknowledging the Kaurna people as the traditional owners of this land uh, and, and uh, acknowledge, um, acknowledge uh, and pay my respect to their elders both past and present, um, and also to any other of the communities uh, and elders that may be present here with us today. Uh, I would also pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have served in the past and continue to serve in our defence forces in t and uh, provide for the security of this nation. I'll note that the, um, the Kaurna people uh, living in this area, up and down the peninsula in effect, um, that they provided the, b both the security and the protection of this land but also of their society. And uh, when, uh, when they felt threat they'd retire from the abundant um, coastal regions and they'd move back into the foothills of the Adelaide Hills uh, and that's where they, they sought their protection uh, for their society. And of course um, things were a little less complex back then um, but indeed uh, if we take a leaf out of their book uh, we need to be able and ready to take whatever action is needed to protect our people and indeed to protect the land that they've, they've so carefully nurtured over many thousands of years. Uh, so I certainly pay my respect to, to, to the, them as the traditional owners. Now, in all likelihood, um, you may not have heard, some of you will, and I've seen a few familiar faces here today, won't, won't have heard much about the organisation that I'm privileged to lead, um, but I'm sure that the functions that we are seeking to undertake will resonate uh, with you as systems engineers and business analysts, whether in industry, government or um, academic uh, uh, areas. And indeed, I'm just interested, how many of you are, are actually engineers in the audience? might be easier if you put a hand up if you're not an engineer. Okay, there's a couple. Now, the reason I say this is I, I got myself in trouble at a defence science and technology seminar where I uh, assumed that everyone was a scientist and, of course, that wasn't the case either. So there's, uh, there's a number of different specialisations that we take, but the engineering aspects and what we do with systems engineering, um, analysts, scientists, engineers, uh, the full spec spectrum is really important to the, to the, the core business. And of course, here I am as a pilot trying to talk to a, a largely an engineer audience about uh, what we're doing and how that might work. Well, you're the experts. I need your systems engineering expertise to, to help me pull this through. And certainly uh, to collect or to enlist your collective wisdom to help with the ongoing professionalism of our workforce and, and indeed involve some world-class tools that will assist us with techniques and methodologies so that we can ensure that every soldier, sailor, airman, airwoman um, has the best possible kit at the right time uh, to do the tasks that they've been set by our government. And of course, as I've said, I bring an operator's view to that. Um, and in the business of war fighting, I certainly don't want a level playing field. So uh, um, when I think back to my glory days when I strapped my pink body into a grey aeroplane, um, I certainly wanted to make sure that that aircraft was the best possible um, weapon system that I had available to take me into the face of danger. Um, and I acknowledge there's people in this audience that have contributed to me being able to achieve just that. So I thank you for that and I certainly look forward to further work in the future to make sure that we continue to do so. Um, to provide context for this presentation, I'll cover some key historic points uh, by way of background as to where we've come from 
in the evolution of force design so far. And then I'll sum up in what I regard as some of the key points uh, as we transition from implementing our force design to transition that to business as usual uh, with the objective to achieve a joint and integrated force by design for our future. Throughout the last decade or so, if I can work this slide, um, defence has been the subject of numerous reviews and this is the front page of the first principles review uh, that was commissioned by, by our government. Um, and it summarises really uh, down to fine print the number of re reviews that have occurred um, since the period of about 1970 and on. Now we, uh, so that's a, you can see the, the number of them that are there. Uh, and we had a pretty good record of not fully implementing the review's recommendations. Um, or we tailored what we interpreted about those reviews, we tailored them um, to what we thought was feasible, achievable uh, and relevant. Now a, foreign, uh, a Senate Foreign Affairs Defence and Trade References Committee report on defence procurement procedures um, said this about um, how defence has behaved and I quote, the weight of evidence indicates that not only has defence's preoccupation with process been misguided, but it has been counterproductive. In response to identified problems, Defence has created a, pro a procurement process that is convoluted and overburdened by administration. And of course, that's what the first principles review um, came to the heart of. So I'd like to highlight some of the deficiencies of, uh, of where we were. And, uh, and I'll quote from um, a colleague and boss of mine, uh, a previous Chief of Air Force, Air Marshal Jeff Brown, uh, and he uh, had an opportunity to speak at a Williams Foundation dinner uh, in May of 2014. Um, that seemed reasonably contemporary a few years ago, but it's very quickly going into the past when we're right in the middle of now trying to remedy what he talked about. Now, I must, must uh, emphasise that Air Marshal Brown at the time did comment very clearly on two specific caveats with respect to the first principles review. Um, and he stated that it presented an enormous, enormous opportunity for us. Uh, and he also noted that defence is staffed by some of the most talented and committed people that you'll meet anywhere in the world, but we are really hamstrung by the organisational structures that we put those people in. Specifically, he raised some key points. He said that defence has to fundamentally move away from an industrial acquisition process. Uh, he discussed the difficulty of actually getting anything meaningful done in the defence organisation due to the number of stakeholders that, that hold a red card to progress. And most telling, and I once again quote, probably a worse indictment for us is, uh, if I want something to happen in defence, if I don't want something to happen in defence, my tactic is to send it on whatever process we've designed in response to a previous review, because that is an absolute guarantee that it will not succeed. <laughs> so for a leader at the top end of, of an organisation, that's a pretty uh, deep comment to make. His words also highlight that all too often our focus on process over outcomes, um, and you know, that's a problem that we in defence, um, we, we cannot, um, cannot accept. And certainly our outcome is to ensure that our deployed forces are equipped with the right equipment at the right time. So, uh, I emphasise that, that a key enabler of any review is time. Uh, time to analyse, time to implement, but most importantly, uh, time to ensure cultural and behavioural changes have occurred. We never in the past have given changes or those changes from previous reviews sufficient time to take effect and we seldom focused on the key aspects of culture and behaviour in order to achieve sustained and irreversible change for the better. In essence, we never truly allowed implementation to transfer or transition forward to business as usual. So in the context of this review, no pressure really, um, just the risk of history repeating itself if we fail to give the changes time to implement uh, and bring forward some of the options that we have an opportunity to develop. But this is what we're now changing and through the six recommendations of the review, which you can see on the slide there, supported by 70 specific recommendations of action, uh, we should be able to enable that change. And the key recommendation related to force design um, is the recommendation one, which is to establish a strong strategic centre to strengthen accountability and top level decision making. I'd also like to point out that our work is intimately linked from a capability design and traceability viewpoint 
to recommendation two, which is to establish a single end-to-end -end capability development function. Now these, res these recommendations were not the start of a rev revolution in, for or by defence. The functions were already being undertaken, either intentionally or accidentally within the department. And I uh, just recall a comment uh, from Dr. Hans Marx there about discipline. So a lot of what we're doing is common sense, but we're underpinning it by um, dedicated discipline and coherent approaches that are documented um, so that, that it doesn't just drift from person to person, it will remain there and that culture and behavioural change can be underpinned by, uh, by some facts and discipline. The first principle review simply raised the profile of these activities, ensured that some, uh, someone was appointed as a responsible officer for their implementation and that we could transition to business as usual. And this is where I see that the outcomes of this review are different. It will require continued focus, execution of those clear accountabilities and time to consider cultural reform, more collegiate behaviour and innovation as business as usual and not merely as taglines. The first principle view and one defence emphasises the need for what they call the strong strategic centre. Now I also note here that, that uh, there were some infamous words, I think mentioned by the same Air Marshal Jeff Brown, uh, describing the high priests of centralism and arguing that centralism has a stranglehold on management thinking. There is also a sentiment that the best way to get things done is to form a small team. Now in this regard, um, I believe that One Defence is achieving the best possible balance of both of those approaches. To achieve a force design that meets government direction requires key, key, uh, clear leadership and cultural change across our department. We cannot afford to allow investment in capabilities that don't or won't integrate with the joint force and that don't fit within an appropriate balance, most importantly, of investment priorities. Likewise, we cannot afford to be inefficient in decision timelines nor fail in being agile in response to rapidly developing technology, threats and strategic circumstances. The language of top-down design and bottom-up innovation is now very clearly taking shape and is consistent with the first principles review. The accountability of my boss, the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, um, as what we call the Joint Force Authority, will provide clear direction from the strategic centre for that top-down design, if you like, um, commander's intent. The capability managers, uh, they're the chiefs of our services, so chiefs of Navy, Army and Air Force, uh, they are managing the capability to deliver it for us and operate it. Um, them, together with the respective delivery agencies in consultation with industry and academia, can then get on with providing the bottom-up innovation for efficient and effective capability delivery and sustainment. So this brings us to what the department has been doing to meet the intent of that first principles review, um, to, do, to transition to what we call the one defence business model. And this is where defence operates as one integrated system, rather than a number of tribes that tend to or try to focus on achieving um, separate um, outcomes and we can now focus on achieving a truly integrated joint force. And this is where Navy, Army, Air Force, intelligence, cyber, space, other support functions and enabling capabilities are viewed through a single domain lens. The size and complexity of the defence task requires a degree of decentralisation and autonomy uh, within the three services and other large organisational units. However, in the past, the organisation has had too many voices to be effective. It lacked clear, single points of accountability for outcomes, was more focused on detail than alignment with policy or strategy, and it rewarded federated rather than enterprise behaviour. While most people would agree that defence business appears complex, the art for us is to make that complex simple and then make that simple compelling. From my perspective, the key means to achieve that aspiration is at the front end of the capability life cycle, and that truly is the function of force design of which now I'm uh, accountable to deliver. For me, force design is a continuous and ongoing review to understand what is needed in a future force. It allows defence and government to have a shared understanding of the future force we need to operate in the expected future environment, revealing both gaps and opportunities. In the past, such reviews were staffed 
by whoever, whoever was available or could be spared from their usual duties. All very capable and professional staff, but force design was not their primary duty. The establishment of force design division ensures that these reviews will be un undertaken with a professional, skilled and focused workforce where future force considerations are their primary role. Now, uh, in line with that, and, I, and I'll save this for questions, um, one of the things and one of the challenges that we certainly are looking at in terms of our force design outcomes is this balance between what you might call um, decisive design, where we take a look at the future and pick um, one element, uh, and we, we, we uh, invest and spend all our time with one big major muscle move to get us to a future force structure, compared to an emergent design approach where you would take it in a more iterative cycle. So this is a true challenge for us, and if we look at our submarine and shipbuilding programs, uh, where we are committing to platforms and, and systems that will take us, in some cases, not being delivered until 2030, and certainly with a life of type beyond 2050, um, how can we even start to assess what their degree of relevance will be in that far forward time frame? Um, so in effect, uh, I think we're looking at a balance between that decisive design, that big major move, versus that emergent approach um, where we, uh, we look to try and adapt and adjust and iterate to ensure the relevance of our major capability systems as we move forward through the life cycle. And certainly this comes to the heart of what we're trying to do in terms of a capability life cycle. Now the Encozy handbook highlights six generic capability life cycle stages from concept uh, and development to production, utilisation, support and finally retirement. The defence KP life cycle then, uh, just leveraged straight off those, uh, that, that concept, is a four phase and three decision gate process through strategy and concepts, risk mitigation and requirement setting, acquisition and finally in service and disposal. The most relevant to our force design function is the strategy and concepts phase where we, we identify capability needs from our assessment of defence's ability to meet the mission stated and how that might be achieved within a broad funding envelope. It's very much a strategy led and orchestrated from the strategic centre through our senior committee uh, for our force design activities. The key output of this phase is what we call a capability program narrative, noting that we're moving from a project approach to delivery of capability to more a program based solution. So the capability program narrative distills the strategic guidance such as provided by the white paper into the essential what and why to provide direction to those capability managers so that they can then investigate and explain the how. And this is the first step uh, in transparent and traceable decision making. While the bulk of our efforts are focused in this phase, we in Force Design must take an holistic, a holistic view of the capability life cycle so that we can adapt to the evolving threats gaps or opportunity. I also mentioned three decision gates and you can see them on the slide. Gate zero is an internal decision point at the senior committee chaired by my boss, the vice chief. The gate zero decision point focuses on high level review of the capability need, options development, risks and indeed the execution strategy. The key approval gates then aptly named as gate one and two allow government to make funding decisions for the, opposed, for the proposed capability, taking into consideration the integrated investment program. One of the positive outcomes of the first principles review is the ability to tailor a program's journey through the committee process. While the decisions being made at each gate still relate to risk, whether that is capability, scope, technical, financial or other resource, defence is now more risk aware. We focus more on managing risk to un uncover the best outcomes overall for our security. In the past, it, we had at times felt we had to trade off capability to fit the budget or delay projects until we could get the perfect capability, often taking so longer that when we came to delivery, the asset was no longer relevant. We now aim to better explain the risk to government and work with them for the best outcomes, even when the goalposts or operating environment changes and we need to stop or change projects. The integrated investment program articulates
I'm missing a slide in there. Um, the investment program articulates defence's uh, desired capable investment outcomes through a comprehensive review of how defence needs to be structured to meet the challenges of the future out to the 2030s and beyond. This continuing and ongoing force design review ensures alignment between defence strategy, capability and resources. And that's that triangle, triangular link um, that really uh, is the requirement that we need to do to get a balance uh, with an affordable budget. The desired result is an affordable and balanced portfolio of programs that will achieve a highly capable, agile and potent Australian defence force and defence capability more broadly to meet our future requirements. A key companion document resulting from the first principles review which supports the development and implementation of the investment program is the capability life cycle detailed design. Now this artefact is the output of a significant body of work undertaken by our project team and it was that work that was delivered on the 1st of April last year when my division was first formed. Uh, and hence we were just looking at that design and trying to work out how to actually implement um, and that's why I, I didn't take Sean's offer last year. In the last 15 months, however, Force Design has evolved from a team of a few best intentioned and professional individuals to a cohesive focus team that has achieved some key miles, milestones in a short um, period of time. We've commenced the force design cycle and delivered some key concepts that I'll describe shortly and commenced a more deliberate approach to prioritise our capability needs. This force design function by another name is, is mission, en mission engineering or from Robert Gold's presentation to the NDIA Systems Engineering Conference last year, it's the deliberate planning, analysing, organising and integrating of current and emerging operational and system capabilities to achieve desired warfighting mission effects. Now this is an area I understand is gaining some attention within INCOSI, which we in the Force Design Division will be watching uh, with great anticipation and collaboration with people like you will be essential to achieving those outcomes. My division is, is now making considerable investment in organising uh, in engaging key defence and external stakeholders, including industry, uh, the central agencies of government, such as Prime Minister and Cabinet, Treasury and the Department of Finance. And it's our intention to continue regular and frequent engagement beyond implementation as part of our transition to business as usual. Our engagement so far this year has included a number of presentations by my staff and myself at the Williams Foundation, at the Defence Innovation Hub Industry Update uh, with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and of course um, the opportunity here today to engage with you. In September uh, this year we'll be holding a force design conference in, conduction, in, in conjunction with the Capley Systems Centre at the University of New South Wales and uh, using Mike Ryan and his key team. And, uh, and I can certainly discuss that a little further in the question time if you, if you have questions. The outcome of these types of engagements will be the strengthening of collaboration and transparency to ensure traceability in the defence narrative, to increase trust through central agencies, through to government and through to industry. Gaining trust is paramount to resourcing the programs that underpin the, the One Defence model. Central agencies briefings are an open and transparent and sometimes frank dialogue with the program manager so that those central agencies that can then provide a positive recommendation to their minister um, and it's their ministers who vote on the National Security Committee of Cabinet uh, when, we, when our government selects major capital acquisitions. The force design activities are described in the Cable Lifecycle Detailed Design as a set of concurrent processes that include analysis of the current force and development of future, future force options and priorities. Therefore, Force Design Division has been structured to distribute these functions across two branches. The first one is the Joint Force Analysis Branch and the second, Force Options and Plans Branch. Importantly, we're supported by the Investment Portfolio Management Branch who are lodged with us but report direct to the, to the Vice Chief of Defence and they support us in our force design activities. As Head of Force Design, I maintain a direct command relationship to the Vice Chief of Defence in his capacity as both that joint force authority role, but, but most importantly, as his chair of our senior defence investment committee. 
The Director General of our Joint Force Analysis Branch is responsible for a number of key functions and, and he conducts in-depth analysis of our force preparedness, matching sustainment and readiness to resources, strategic guidance and operational requirements. And they're the custodians of the concepts that I mentioned earlier. The first being the Australian Joint Operating Concept, which looks at from a current um, to immediate planned force um, out in, in about the two to 10 year time frame. Then is the future joint operating concept that looks to the next 10 to 20 years, focusing on capabilities have yet, that have yet to um, be considered for our investment program. And finally, the future operating concept explores what we think the world will look like out to 2035 and beyond in order to inform ongoing force design outcomes. These documents and the analysis that underpin them are the primary planning references for our future, or so for our force design activities. They maintain planning standards through the update and review of our current doctrine and adjust accordingly based on lessons feedback from operations and exercises. They also facilitate experimentation as a key function of force options development and assessment. Now, while our services, the Navy, Army and Air Force, have an ongoing series of wargaming and experiments that allow their service chiefs to provide traceable and compelling evidence-based input to our force design activities, our experimentation activities have not existed this coherently in the joint context for the Australian Defence Force uh, for quite some time. So this is really a, a new element of that discipline to deliver a, a repeatable force design outcome. My Director, of, uh, Director General of Force Options and Plans through his branch provides me with an enduring strategic-led and evidence-based assessment of joint force plans and options that enable informed investment. His branch examines force options and conducts assessment of both the plan force, so the one that we'll deliver through our integrated investment program, and the future forces that we might aspire to, to convert identified gaps and opportunities into prioritised capability outcomes. These desired outcomes are then tasked to the capability managers to develop for, for government consideration. The Investment Portfolio Management Branch manages the integrity of the Integrated Investment Program, including development of the biannual Investment Program update to government and the priorities and scheduling of the Investment Program to ensure that we can live within our means but still achieve the required outcomes. Now, there's been an overwhelmingly positive outcome in defence managing the Integrated Investment Program as a portfolio of programs. So, yes, I see the irony in that language. Um, but the name is relative to its purpose, as it is essential for defence to evolve not only processes, but also to mature our investment decision making. So for example, transferring funds between programs pre-first principles review really required nothing less than perfect planetary alignment. However, in the post-review program management paradigm, we have a, a fewer number of overarching streams that are allocated funding, which can be moved around inside the stream and across the varying programs and projects. So our discipline in being able to deliver against this and getting the accountabilities established will be key to ensuring that we have the flexibility to deliver the most cost-effective and affordable investment outcomes while still delivering the capability needs. And if I could refer to the management of portfolio Portfolios Manual, published by the Office of uh, Government Commerce, which is an independent office of Her Majesty's Treasury within the UK. Um, portfolio management will not make decisions regarding the content of the portfolio, initiatives to be included or to be, in, or to be stopped. It will, however, provide the information that enables senior management to exercise informed judgment and also make decision-making decision more transparent. So my division uh, has identified, assessed and prioritised gaps and opportunities across our current and future forces and designed capability based responses to better meet the requirements to defend Australia and its interests. We have submitted the information to government to, to endorse our future force structure. And we'll now do this annually through a program that we, we've tagged the Defence Capability Assessment Program or DCAP. The outcome is the development of force options for potential inclusion in the Integrated Investment Program. The Capability Assessment Program is aligned with 
decision points to inform the biennial investment program updates to government, and inputs to the process will be collected across the full range of stakeholders, including government, capability managers and industry. The outputs will be under, underpinned by readily available and well-documented and archived, evidence-based, prioritised and robust capability investment recommendations. The capability assessment program has three modes of operation to address different time and scope imperatives. The primary mode is what we call the annual mode and that's conducted routinely every year and the outputs align with the, the ministerial biennial updates and are iterative adjustments to our integrated investment program. The fundamental mode uh, is the one that we would conduct and we plan to conduct every four years or as required by government as the basis of the force design update. It, if you like, is a, uh, a major force structure review across our capabilities. It would be used to assess and address our future force gaps and opportunities. And the third mode is the agile mode, used for rapid assessment of specific gaps and opportunities that might require res a resolution within the annual cycle. And this could eventuate from uh, what we define through our joint operations uh, as, a, as an operationally urgent requirement. Key to enabling the outcomes of the capability assessment program is a method for capability and investment prioritisation. Balancing investment priorities within the defence portfolio is a complex business with multiple inputs. And this is an important function of force design. We've looked at a number of methodologies and tools uh, and we've narrowed our preference to a transparent multi-criteria decision analysis process that we've seen used by New Zealand Ministry of Defence in their current defence white paper. This methodology relies on active engagement input from government agencies in determining force structure options. The agencies have observed uh, my division's evaluation workshops and have responded positively to the MCDA proposed methodology. This is by no means the end of the conversation. It's simply the methodology that has allowed us to learn by doing and to achieve what we have in the last 15 months and continue to develop that so that we can be agile and, and understand our challenges for the future. And indeed, uh, having a chat to a few people outside this forum, um, when we look to do that prioritisation process and manage the, the capabilities that we have in front of us, uh, there's two key elements that we still haven't uh, um, resolved how we will, we, we will uh, work through. Uh, and that is a, a, a visualisation tool and an optimisation tool. So when we manage and prioritise capabilities, we still have to play that Tetris game of fitting them within our funding profile. So the optimisation, certainly one area, but the ability to visualise that in a simple sense and have tools available is, is really a key element for us to still realise. To realise a joint force by design, we must also ensure integration by design. And this is the remit of uh, a colleague, of, a colleague in, in arms of mine, the head of Joint Cabling Management Integration, another two-star officer who reports direct to the Vice Chief of Defence. He's responsible for assuring the ADF is interoperable both within and with our allies and coalition partners. The Cable East Systems Centre at the University of New South Wales undertook a significant research uh, task on behalf of his, um, of his division um, and they developed a framework for us. The final framework uh, report was delivered on the 29th of June this year with a roadmap that enabled implementation by January 2018. And this will provide for guided autonomy for the capability managers to achieve the required level of integration. And that's really a discussion uh, that ranges from um, at the high end of integration, I guess you'd assume that we had artificial intelligence, um, but certainly across our force and integrated force uh, versus a cooperative or co um, collaborative force, um, and how do we balance our investment priorities to, the, to get the right level of integration to ensure that we have superior combat effect um, at an affordable level at the point that we need it. Uh, so this piece of work is really critical to what we're doing um, within the integration division, but also to inform what I do in terms of force design. I'd like to emphasise that where we are now in evolving force design has occurred in a very short space of time. Um, this process will need more time to mature and more time to become business as usual. In order to get 
to such an established state, we need to record our decisions and assumptions, not to mention store and interrogate the terabytes of data that will support those decisions. We know that we have evidence gaps from some previous reviews due to the ad hoc, ad hoc nature and compressed time, time frames uh, by which they were conducted. And this situation cannot be maintained. So what we are developing is a force design body of knowledge, just as there are systems engineering, business analysis and project management bodies of knowledge. And that's to record the questions, the data, the assumptions, processes and analysis uh, in a continual and ongoing manner. The development and management of the force design body of knowledge is certainly an area we might need to collaborate, well in fact will need to collaborate with industry and academia to understand how we might achieve it. A key aspect of delivering our future force is clear articulation of our capability needs traced unambiguously to that strategic guidance, um, to the strategic assessment and balanced against our resources. And this traceability function doesn't cease at that gate zero. Like integration and interoperability assurance, it spans the capability life cycle to assure all capability outcomes are fit for purpose and align with strategic guidance. Joint force by design is ongoing and continuous, taking a holistic view of all capabilities at whatever phase of their life cycle, cycle they happen to be at when we run our DCAP process. We have to be able to provide a clear, coherent, relatable and consistent capability narrative to both the public and political spheres. This narrative must begin internally. It must be contested before we begin our engagement with other external stakeholders stakeholders, including the, those central agencies um, and also industry and academia. Force design is not about the strategic centre determining force requirements in splendid isolation and we can't and won't operate in a vacuum. Good relationships between force design and our key stakeholders are critical to achieving the best uh, outcome that we can. We draw on experts and information sources from both within the department and beyond and in particular we work closely with the Department of Defence Service chiefs and group heads who play a vital role providing input into our force design as well as a critical role in shaping the design of the future force. They are the experts of their domain and we respect that and we need their engagement to tell the story. One key part of um, our activities and certainly um, it's key to the risk mitigation and acquisition phases is a, is a process that we've now put in place uh, as a result of first principles re review, which we call the smart buyer approach. And it was implemented by the capable Acquis acquisition and sustainment group. And it's a key part of this collaborative engagement through the capability life cycle. Most importantly, it's conducted right at the front end of the capability life cycle. Smart buyer is a means for tailoring the way which programs pass through the KB life cycle based on the key risks. Central to smart buyer is a new decision framework that identifies key project risks in consultation with industry and we use that risk to analyse how to tailor the programs and how they will be executed. And for example, uh, decisions, early decisions around whether to, to, uh, to proceed down a sole source acquisition or to proceed for a competitive tender. The key takeout here is there are opportunities for industry and academia to be engaged under the smart buyer framework. And now this engagement's not new, and, uh, it, but it's previously been ad hoc and it certainly hasn't been business as usual. Now our focus is to ensure that defence doesn't jump into solutions too early or that decisions are too narrow or do not allow for innovation. And that is where industry involvement can help deliver innovative, cost effective and fit for purpose solutions. In order to implement a smart buyer process, defence must also instill a smart customer mindset. So how do we develop such a mindset in an organisation that is pri primarily about warfighting? In my view, we do it the same way as we grow, we grow our leaders, providing education, training and experience throughout their career. And of course, early inter interaction and collaboration with both industry and academia. Defence already provides education and training opportunities through the various domestic um, and overseas tertiary and vocational education institutions. We also need to build an experience base that might include multiple postings into the CLC 
or the KB life cycle, so that when they too are appointed as head of force design, we will have set them up for success. They won't be able to use the excuse that being a pilot means they don't understand systems engineering. We'll start to see uh, more military officers seconded to industry as part of their career progression. And that will allow them to foster an understanding of the process from industry's view viewpoint and to develop, most importantly, their commercial acumen. In addition to the smart buyer team, where else might I foster innovation and collaboration? Force Design Division remains closely engaged with our own Defence Industry Policy Division and the Defence Innovation Hub to assist in establishing a collaborative environment with industry and academia. The Force Design Division analysed uh, innovation focus areas and we have recommended the first round of innovation priorities for the Innovation Hub that were agreed by the Investment Committee and announced by the Minister of Defence in September of last year. And indeed, We've just uh, gone through and re-evaluated our priorities there for innovation um, for, the, for the next year's uh, rounds and prioritisation for innovation. And the considerations that we've uh, considered in, or that we put forward in terms of priorities include intelligence, surveillance, space, cyber uh, and uh, amphibious capabilities. Develop and analysis, analysis of defence's innovation priorities now is now a key outcome of the DCAP process. Um, and indeed, I'm very much aware when I talk innovation, that I get the right balance between providing guidance and priorities for innovation without bounding or constraining um, both industry and academia and their ability to look outside the box. Uh, there's things that we don't know uh, and things that I need to find out about in terms of, uh, of opportunities for us. As I mentioned at the start of my presentation, I'm seeking to enlist the collective wisdom of the systems engineering and business analysis fraternities. I see the benefit of industry and academia not just assisting our thinking and solutioneering, but also playing a part in progressing our narrative. We'll do our part through ongoing and continual engagement, um, but all of industry and academia are a part of our evolving journey. So engagement opportunities such as this uh, through our Force Design Conference in September can certainly help to increase the visibility and the understanding of the criticalities of our capabilities. Force design is one function within the, the One Defence business model and our role is to achieve better design up front, leading to more effective and efficient delivery of capability further down the capability life cycle. Importantly, our role doesn't end at gate zero. We have a consistent and holistic view of the capability life cycle to ensure that our analysis considers the force in being through the planned force to what we might assess as a future force. While my division's function of force design is only 15 months old, we will continue to evolve from where the force structure review has placed us. As Defence has already begun implementing the recommendations of the first principles review, and our challenge is to transition those to business as usual to achieve an integrated and joint force by design. We'll continue to make the complex simple and the simple compelling, and we'll ensure that the resulting dialogue with government is open honest, traceable, and most importantly, evidence-based. So we are aiming to take advantage of the enormous opportunities that the first principle review has provided us, but there's a lot more to do. Um, we're committed to it. Uh, and with collaboration uh, with people such as you and the opportunities and intellect that we can gather, um, then we very much look forward to providing the right um, shaped and sized and affordable force that Australia will need for its uh, future security. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you and I uh, certainly invite any questions.